Good morning. Well, thank you for the <clears throat> good time of worship with team men. Uh, especially like the song, uh, You Are Holy, You Are Mighty, all through two different voices sang it. And uh, <clears throat> both the voices converged together uh, to say, You are my Prince of Peace and I will live my life for you. Right? Uh, so I'm very glad we all said that because that's really the topic of my message today. Uh, <clears throat> about how much we really trust God. Uh, you know, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And I don't know how many of you realized it, but we, we sang that in a song as well. Uh, we proclaimed that we will uh, trust in the Lord with all my heart. You, you remember that? Some of you probably do. Uh, we did sing that. <clears throat> we did proclaim uh, in God's presence that we trust in God with all our heart. So, uh, that was very encouraging. Alright, so the, the topic today is uh, really to what point are we willing to trust in God? Now, you remember when we <coughs> did this uh, series on the strongholds, we saw that uh, one of the key elements was on moving from just intellectually believing in God to really trusting Him, right? really fully believing his words, taking him at his word and trusting him completely. And uh, we're going to dwell a little more on that aspect today, on what that really means <clears throat> and uh, how we can really assess ourselves. And so the first part is where we intellectually agree with all the facts. Right? We agree and believe that Jesus died on the cross, is the son of God and all those things. And the other part is what are the implications of truly believing that? Do I really take God at His word? Right? Now God has said that He is our loving Father. And Jesus is our good shepherd. And we see these verses uh, <clears throat> that we read in Matthew. Will it quickly turn there maybe? Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, verse 26 where Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Right? And then also a few verses down in verse 30, Jesus says, Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the, into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Right? So what Jesus is conveying is, okay, if you really trust me, then uh, trust that I will provide for you. Right? Oh, you have little faith. Don't you think that if I can clothe these, the grass and the flowers and if I can feed these birds, will I not take much more care of you? Right? That's what Jesus conveyed. And then later on we see, Jesus says that God knows everything about you. He says that God knows even the number of hair that you have on your head. Right? He knows everything about you. Everything that's happening in your life. And he says, why do you worry then? Don't worry. Just, just trust God. Right? That's what Jesus uh, says over and over again. So the question is then, to what point are we willing to trust God? Yeah. Now, sometimes we're willing to trust God when everything is fine. Right? We're willing to trust God maybe as long as He's answering all our prayers, we're willing to trust Him. Uh, sometimes we're willing to trust God until uh, a serious sickness hits and uh, that's the limit of our trust. Right? And then after that, uh, we have to lean on, on our own understanding and <clears throat> we have to get things done on our, our own way. Maybe uh, maybe we can go further and, and say the point of trusting God is still somebody puts a piston to my head and says, uh, say that you don't believe in Jesus. Right? Maybe that's the point till I trust. And at that point, I'll say maybe that's too much for me to trust. Right? Uh, I'd rather take things into my own hands and uh, do what I think is right. So what really is the point on the scale where do each one of us uh, fall in how much are you willing to trust God today and uh, the point of all this is knowing that the, what the Bible has said is that he is our father, he is a loving father he is a good shepherd and you can't trust him right? now I, I'd like to uh, look at four different uh, aspects to, uh, to really help us understand this topic more uh, the first one is uh, trusting God through times of waiting. Uh, the second is trusting God through unanswered prayer. 
The third is trusting God through life's unfair circumstances. And the fourth is trusting God through persecution. Right? So we look at these four and we look at what we can get from the Bible and <coughs> from different stories of lives around us. Lives around us. <coughs> so let's look at the first one then. Trusting God through times of waiting. Right? How many of us have had to wait for a long time for God to really answer a prayer of us? Some of us? Yeah. So, you know how difficult it is, right? To really wait on the Lord. And uh, many of us would have got a promise from God. People might have come and told us that this is what God says for you. And then waiting for that promise to be fulfilled in our lives, but it's just not happening. And we expect that it will come true maybe in this, that year, maybe in the next year, uh, maybe in two years at max, and then nothing's happening, right? <clears throat> maybe it's a promise of healing. Maybe it's a promise of a job. Maybe it's a promise of uh, getting married. Maybe it's a promise of uh, you know, whatever, some particular breakthrough. Maybe it's a promise that God will use you in a mighty way. But then nothing happens. Wait for a year, two years, three years, nothing happens. Then uh, it's natural for some people to think maybe that was wrong. Maybe that wasn't God whom I heard. Maybe it was just my imagination. Right? Or maybe God's forgotten all about me. Or maybe I've got so much sin in my life that, that God's not listening to me anymore. Or maybe I now have to do what I think is right. right? And uh, like there was in Proverbs we read, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. So maybe it's time for me to start leaning on my own understanding. Right? How do we wait? And how do we trust God in times of waiting? Let's look at a couple of lives from the Bible. Uh, you can turn your Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel. Anywhere in 1 Samuel. And we can leave it there. <coughs> so we're going to look at the life of Abraham first. Right? Now, um, God gave Abraham a promise. Right? We read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 15. It was... No, it's not written. It, it, we read it in uh, Genesis. Sorry. It's in Genesis chapter 15. Yeah, you can turn to Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 15 was 5. So uh, God speaking to Abraham and uh, God brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. Right? So God gave Abraham a promise uh, that he's going to have so many descendants. And the next verse is, and he believed in the Lord. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. God said something, he believed it. Okay, however unbelievable it was. And we read even before that, when uh, God calls Abraham out to leave his, uh, his home, where in chapter 12 we read this, where God says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right? So God uh, essentially calls Abraham out of his country, of his family, of everything that he's used to. And he says, okay, now move out. I am not going to tell you where I'm going to take you, but just move out. Right? Um, so Abraham has got uh, a few promises. He's believed in the promises. And uh, so now he's got this promise of, of getting a lot of descendants. So... For sure he's going to have children. And uh, he gets this at the age of 75. And so he waits. He waits a year, two years, three years, and four years, five years. And finally, uh, after 10 years, his patience runs out a little bit. But more than that, his wife's patience runs out more. And uh, <clears throat> Sarah comes and tells him, you know what, uh, God has told you that he's going to give you this and all, but maybe you have to lean on your understanding a bit. You know, maybe let's help God out a little bit. right? Uh, and then we know the story, uh, Ishmael is born. And of course, that's not God's will. And uh, there's a lot of implications even to, to this day of uh, Abraham and Sarah trying to help God. right? But then after that, God has mercy, Abraham continues to trust, and then he continues to wait. right? He waits another 15 years 
Alright, so it's a total of 25 years before God has fulfilled his promise of a son being born. And finally, at the age of 100, Isaac is born to Abraham. Alright, finally, God did fulfill his promise uh, at his appointed time. And uh, we, we see from this that uh, Abraham had to wait for a very long time. And God expected that Abraham would not help God out during this time of waiting. Right? That was God's expectation. And God expected that if I've told you something, I will do it. And I have my timing. I know when the right time is. And I know when I should do things. Right? Trust me. Alright. And then Isaac was born and Isaac uh, grows up and God gives Abraham another promise. We read this in Genesis chapter 21 uh, verse 12 where where God tells Abraham in Isaac your seed shall be called. Alright. So what God is telling Abraham is your descendants my chosen race is going to come out of Isaac. Right? So definitely Isaac is going to have children. Alright, so Isaac uh, grows up at the age of 40. Uh, we know the story where uh, he's trusting in God for God to bring the right bride for him and God does that through you know, a, a, a miraculous way, through a sign. God brings Rebecca. Right? Now Isaac is married to the chosen bride and Isaac knows this promise that he's the chosen lion and, and God is going to bless him with children and they start waiting for a child right so they wait a year two years three years uh, do you know how many years he waited any of you huh? all right so so he keeps waiting five years ten years fifteen years it's like god uh, did i hear you right when you said that it's through me that your chosen race is going to come about there is this chosen bride that you bring to me before me and, and she's barren right what's wrong God did you get something wrong somewhere so Isaac realizes that Rebecca is barren right uh, God's ways are so mysterious right he promises something and then he gives you a situation that's totally opposite of what you expect right uh, so then we read in uh, Genesis 25, 21. So, so Isaac starts praying to God, right? Uh, he prays for many years, and uh, in verse 21 we read where he, he now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. All right. So he keeps pleading with God. God, please do something, right? He doesn't lose hope. The Bible doesn't say that he lost hope or he questioned God, but he keeps pleading God. Right? And finally, God uh, hears his prayer and Rebecca conceives. Now, I'm sure this, uh, all this wasn't God's plan, right? Because God has promised it. God knows if Rebecca is barren or not. And God knows that he's going to set things right. Right? And finally, uh, Rebecca conceives. And as we know this, uh, Jacob and Esau are born and and, uh, and all that happens. Right? Now, uh, we see in both these lives, Abraham and Isaac, that they, both of them got a promise. Both of them were faced with circumstances <coughs> soon after that that seemed to indicate that the promise could not be fulfilled. Right? But yet they trusted in God. They waited, they pleaded, they waited for much longer than probably they expected but finally God did come back God did fulfill his promise at his appointed time right and so God's ways are not always our ways God's timings are not always our timings and we may be waiting for a job or a project or, or, or children or a marriage or a healing we may be waiting for many things and God may have promised us as well but today we see from his word that God, God will always fulfill his promise. But he expects us to trust in him. That he will fulfill it. Now let's look, an look at another life. Let's look at the life of Saul. Right? Now Saul also had a promise. 
Uh, we read, read about it in, in 1 Samuel, chapter 10. Can one of you read uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 10? Uh, that's okay. I read that. Uh, so basically, that's when Samuel comes and he uh, anoints Saul as the king over Israel. And uh, basically, God says that uh, that God is appointing him king to have victory over all the enemies of the Israelites all around them. Right. <clears throat> so that's that's God's promise. He's God's anointed. So there's a, there's a big promise on Saul. There's a big anointing on Saul. And then we read uh, a couple of chapters later, there's a very interesting uh, situation where uh, in chapter 13, we read about Saul going and attacking one of the Philistine camps, all right? And uh, basically, uh, Jonathan goes and does that. He, he destroys one particular camp of the Philistines, one garrison, and then everybody's on alert. There's kind of, you know, uh, uh, war antenna is up. And all Israel comes to know of this, all Israel gathers together and totally there's, uh, we read there's about 3,000 men of Israel, okay, 3,000 men of Israel gather together to, to kind of get ready for war and uh, Saul blows the trumpet and all that and uh, the Philistines also kind of get ready and how many Philistines are there? Verse 5, can one of you read verse 5 please? Came up and encamped to the east of Yeah. Now, what is this? 3,000 Israelites are gathered together. And now, on the other side, Saul looks there and sees across on another hill 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand on a seashore. Right? And then <coughs> Saul says, Okay, I have to go to God, I have to seek God. Is, is he going to give us victory? Now, uh, Samuel had, had told him to go to a particular uh, mount, which is, uh, we read about that in verse 8, uh, to Gilgal. He says, uh, go to Gilgal, wait there for seven days. I will come. Um, Samuel tells, had, had told Saul, I will come there. I will make sacrifice to God. And... Uh, God is going to tell you what to do. Alright? So wait for that. So uh, Saul goes to this place, Gilgal, and he's, he's waiting there. All these people are there. Now when the Israelites saw these 30,000 chariots and these huge number of people, obviously the Israelites get scared. They start, you know, going away from Saul. Uh, we read here that some of them went and hid in caves. So Saul's count of people are decreasing. Alright? And... Uh, now there's about uh, about 600 people left with Saul. And he's waiting on this place of Gilgal, waiting for Samuel to come and offer this offering to God and for God to then speak to him and what he has to do, now how he has to proceed. So he waits. Now Samuel told him to wait how many days? Seven days. So he's waiting day one, day two, day three. Now this goes back to the question, to what point are you willing to trust God? Day five, day six, day seven, morning maybe? So Saul waits and waits and waits and waits. Finally he reaches almost the end of day 7. And then Saul says, Okay, so now I have to lean on my own understanding. My, my point has reached of trust. I have to take things into my hands. I don't know what's happened to Samuel. So I've forgotten about it. No, so let me offer this to, to the Lord. All right? And uh, Saul knows that not anybody is allowed to make an offering to the Lord. Right? There's a whole... Uh, ceremony around with this chosen people, the priests who are to offer sacrifice to God. Now Saul says, okay, now, so uh, let me take things into my own hands, let me offer sacrifice. So Saul offers sacrifice to God. He does the burnt offering. And we read uh, verse 9. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Verse 10. Now it happened. As soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, God's timing is perfect, right? As soon as he had finished that, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? 
So I said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed, the Philistines have gathered together at Mikmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled to offer the offering. All right. So basically, I saw that the people were going away. I saw that there was a huge number of Philistines there. I saw that you are not coming on time and I thought I have to do something. And so I did it. All right. Now what happened because of this? Now this is a, a good example where a person did not wait. He took things into his own hands. And what was the consequence? Do you know what was the consequence of this action of Saul? He lost, he lost his kingdom, right? That is what Samuel says. Uh, you've acted foolishly. you are not kept the command of the Lord. And Samuel says, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Right? God's plan was that Saul would be the chosen one. Right? And that he would have his, uh, his kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself another man after his own heart. He lost his kingdom. Right? So he paid a very big price. Now the question is, what is it that enabled Abraham and Isaac to be able to wait and trust him and Saul not to be able to do that? Right? That's an important question because uh, <clears throat> that's what we learn from. Now if you look at Abraham and Isaac's life, and this is an important thing, both Abraham and Isaac, before they came across this time of waiting for this particular promise, they had already entrusted their whole life to God. Right? Now Abraham did that when God called Abraham out. We read that in Genesis 12. God says, okay, come out from your people, from your land. Abraham trusted God with his whole life. Right? And for Abraham, at that point, the point of trust was death. My whole life. Because he was willing to leave everything that he had. His family, his place and everything. And not knowing where God is going to live, lead him, he was willing to go ahead with his life. And in the case of Isaac, do you know... Uh, what it was with Isaac? The time when... Uh, now Isaac as well already had entrusted his life to God. And we see that in the, uh, in the instance of Abraham taking him for sacrifice. Right? Now Abraham wasn't a small little baby when Abraham took him uh, to sacrifice him uh, on the Mount Moriah. Uh, because we, we read in Genesis 22, 6 that uh, when Abraham was going up the mountain, all the wood that was needed for the burnt offering was carried by Isaac right? Uh, so Isaac carried it up the mountain so obviously he can't be a very small boy he's at least old enough to carry a lot of wood and uh, apparently there's quite a bit of wood you need for a burnt offering which is what he was supposed to offer uh, so that's one and then we also see when, when Isaac reaches on top Isaac asks, asks Abraham okay we, we have the wood, wood and uh, we have everything set up but where's the lamb right? so Isaac is old enough to know the protocol, to know what's required for a burnt offering. So Isaac is not a small boy. He's at least you know, in his teens or he's big enough to uh, think for himself. And Isaac, at that point, lays himself on the altar, as we, as we read. Right? He does so willingly. He doesn't fight against his you know, hundred and whatever old father. He trust, he, he exhibits his trust. He's trusted God to the point of death. Right? So both Abraham and Isaac had made a decision even before this test came in that they entrusted their lives completely to the Lord. And therefore they were able to wait and trust God for a particular specific promise. Right? So the, the thing is that if, you're not, if we haven't entrusted our whole life to the Lord Right? and trust ourselves to God and if our trust isn't to the point of death it's very difficult to then trust God for specific situations and circumstances for a job, for a marriage you know, for whatever it is it becomes very difficult right? and if you look at the life of Saul Saul had not done this Saul was ordained, he was appointed but we don't read of any instance where Saul committed his whole life to God and so when the test came Saul failed. Right? And that's, that's something very, very important. And, and I believe there are some of us here 
who have not really entrusted our lives completely to God. Right? <clears throat> Where we might be trusting in God for specific things and we might be waiting. But we find the wait painful because perhaps we haven't entrusted God completely with our whole life. And say, I'm willing to trust you to the point of death. Right? Now, <clears throat> you see, God needs just an instant to turn things around. We read about... Uh, in, uh, in John chapter 5, in the pool of uh, Bethesda, where, where we read that uh, there's a man who's waited for how many years? 38 years for, <clears throat> for healing. And he's right there, he knows what the solution is, he's trying to do it, but he can't do it. Very frustrating, 38 years. And then Jesus comes in, and in an instant, Jesus heals him. He's been waiting for this long. But it takes just a moment for God to turn things around. And God doesn't even do it in the way that he expects or this man expects to be healed. Jesus doesn't put him into the pool. Jesus says, okay, start up, you're healed. That's it. God's ways are above our ways. right? He can work in miraculous ways. And he needs just a moment to turn things around. But God expects that we wait till that moment when he turns things around. Right? Alright, so that's, that's the first part of trusting God through times of waiting. Let's look, look at the second one. Trusting God through unanswered prayer. Now, there was this, uh, I've heard about this pastor, an Indian pastor. He's a famous faith healer. He's a, he's a very famous uh, preacher and faith healer. and He's got a son and uh, his son gets a sickness. And of course, he, he trusts in God for the healing and all that. But his son dies of that sickness. And now this, this preacher is very upset. He believes that God is going to raise him up from death because God is going to heal him. And God doesn't raise him up from the death. And uh, in fact, this, this person, he's unwilling to let his son be buried. Right? It's, it's a true story. He's unwilling to allow his son to be taken out for burial because he, <clears throat> he's still holding on to the fact that this cannot happen, right? And uh, finally, his, his faith is shaken, and uh, a whole lot of things happen. And uh, you know, some of us may have been in situations like this where we've been waiting on God, we've been trusting in God for something, maybe a healing, right? But it's not happened, right? What is our response to be, right? When we've been praying, but God's not answering the prayer, how do we respond? And there are two extremes. There are people who say that, uh, that, okay, God will heal if He wants to. So I'll just pray, okay, God, if He wants you heal, right? If He wants He'll heal. So there's nothing I can do. There are other people who say that God will certainly heal, right? In every situation, God will heal. And if that doesn't happen, that their faith is shaken. What is the right attitude, right? But this is a question that that had been on my mind for a long time uh, and I found the answer through the life of David. Right? So we can, we can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and uh, what we see from the life of, of David is, is a very good example of how we are to respond in such situations. Now the situation is that uh, David and Bathsheba, of course we know the story where uh, David sees Bathsheba and he lusts after her and he gets her husband killed in battle and then David marries Bathsheba. And then, of course, this is not pleasing to God. And after the marriage, a child is born to Bathsheba and uh, this child is, is stricken with a disease, right, a serious illness. And what is David's response here? So let's look at this. So let's look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And uh, right, so I'm reading from uh, 16 onwards. So the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. And then on the seventh day it came to pass the child died. Alright, so for seven days, David's response was, I'm going to fast 
I'm going to lie down before God. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to lie in God's presence. I'm going to fast and I'm going to plead and I'm going to pray. Essentially, I'm going to do everything that I can. I'm going to shut down my life. I'm not going to go to work. I'm not going to do anything. And he closed himself up and he went before God and said, God, please, please have mercy. Please heal this child. That was his response. He went all out. Okay, all out before God, pleading for God to move. All right? Now, after seven days, what happens? His child dies. All right? Now, he can respond two ways now. Now he can say, what God? I did all this. I pleaded for seven days. I stopped everything and still you didn't answer. What is this God? All right? But David's response is very interesting. What happens after that? So now that the servants of David were afraid because, you know, when the child was still alive, although he didn't listen to us, he was like this man who was so possessed and, and in God's presence. Now, how is he going to respond when he's telling him that the child has died? Right? He's not going to listen to us, of course. He may do some harm, right? So he may go kill us or he may suicide or he may do something. Who knows what he's going to do? He's king, right? Now, Verse 19, when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. So David goes and asks his servants, is the child dead? And they said, yes, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed him, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house and when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Amazing, right? Right? Even to the point of saying, What? Are you serious? Right? How could you do this? Right? So what we need is instantly they would change everything. He says, okay, fine. Child's died. He removes his, his morning clothes. He puts on his king's apparel. He washes his face. He removes all his ashes and sackcloth. And he says, okay, bring a banquet before me. And he starts eating. All right? How could he do this? All right? And so his servant said, Whoa, what's happening? How could you do this? Yeah, so that's exactly what the servant says. What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child when it was alive, and now when the child is dead, you arose and ate food? Now listen to David's response. He said, When the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Shall I go to him? Uh, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So David knew where the child was gone. David knew that the child has gone to heaven to be with the Lord and one day he's going to see him. And now there's no point in him mourning and fasting, right? So you see that um, the lesson here is that there is a point, right? As long as there is hope, you go all out, right? You fast and you pray and you stop everything else you're doing and you seek the Lord and believe that God will perhaps answer your prayer. But then if a point comes, where your prayer has not been answered. Then, it switches to God's sovereignty. Where we believe God is sovereign. He knows what He's doing. And I trust Him with my whole life. And I trust that He knows what He's doing. And so, I will worship Him. Right? We read that David changed his clothes and went in and worshipped God. He said, God, you're sovereign. Right? So, the sovereignty of God becomes of paramount importance after the event. Before the event, it is trust and faith and pleading with God. Your hope still remains. And that's a very valuable lesson for each one of us. Because sometimes we allow our hurts to linger on even after uh, an unfortunate event has happened. Right? We allow us to affect our relationship with others and with God and all that. But that's not what God expects. God's saying is, you trust in me. Right? And that's what we, we read. And even in David's life, you see that David had entrusted his whole, whole life to God. Right? And that's why he was able to respond in, in such a way. And that's very clear in all the many, many Psalms that David has written. Uh, and even when we read, you know, when, when David goes into a battle with Goliath, he says that, you know, I've trusted in God. God has saved me from bears and lions. And now also I will trust in God. I will go out and fight this battle with this giant and God is going to be with me. So he trusted. It shows even at that point when he was a young boy. He had entrusted his own life to God. Right? He's stepping out, putting his life at stake. Right? Trusting in God. So 
he had entrusted his life to God. And his point on the scale was at the end. And I'll trust God to the point of death. And therefore he was able to respond in this kind of a way. Right? And uh, there is this, this person we know who, uh, there's this lady uh, where she, uh, you know, at the end of her pregnancy, <clears throat> there was a complication and she had a stillborn child. And uh, she was a, a Christian, but uh, many people in her family were not really fully believing in Jesus. And after this happened, uh, within a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, looking at the way she responded to the situation, her father, her mother, her sister and her husband all gave her life to Jesus Christ and were baptized. Right? Now, I'm sure that uh, God is not uh, a debtor. God will always repay right, what we have lost on this earth. And God's ways are not our ways. And sometimes God expects that our lives are God-centric and not me-centric. Right? The, the spotlight and the focus of our lives sometimes are ourselves and our families. But what God expects is that we trust in Him enough that the spotlight is on Him. Right? And our lives are God-centric and not me-centric. It's not all about me and my uh, prayers and answers to my prayers. And you see, when, when our life changes from being me-centric to God-centric, the question in our minds changes from, you know, how, is, how and when is God going to you know, fulfill my prayers to how and when am I going to fulfill God's plans for me? Right? It changes from my plans to God's plans. And that happens when we've really entrusted our lives completely to God. Right? When we can trust Him with every situation, we can trust Him even to the point of death. Right? Alright, so now let's, let's uh, look at the third one. Trusting God through life's unfair circumstances. Now, uh, some of us may feel at times that we've been dealt an unfair set of cards uh, in life. That life's not being fair with us. We've been put through situations and circumstances that are really unfair, right? unjust. And uh, sometimes it, it becomes difficult to trust God. So God, why did this have to happen to me? Right? Maybe there's, there's an accident and a, uh, a person's lost his, his limbs. Right? And it's very easy to say, God, why me? Why, why does this have to happen to me? Right? All my plans are dashed. Right? And uh, there is this American songwriter who lived a couple of centuries back. Her name was Fanny Crosby. Um, she uh, had, a, had quite an unfortunate life. Uh, when she was six weeks old, she developed a cold and infection and because of that, her eyes uh, were inflamed and their family doctor was not in town. Okay? So, another person uh, who's, who was not really a doctor, he was a quack, he, he acted like a doctor, he stepped in and said, okay, let me treat this baby. And uh, this man, he decides that the, the, the solution is to put hot mustard on the eyes of the baby on the six week old baby and so he puts hot mustard on her eyes and with that she loses sight of both her eyes right so fanny crosby at the, at the age of just less than two months has lost sight of her eyes and a few months later her, his father her father passes away and so now uh, there's her and her mother and uh, her grandmother who are living and obviously she's she's it's a very unfair circumstance that she's been born into and for no fault of hers, right? But we see uh, that, that uh, Fanny Crosby really trusted God with her whole life. And uh, even at the age of eight, uh, she'd written poems that, that show how much she trusted God with her whole life. Instead of feeling bitter, she entrusted her whole life to God. And uh, let me just read to you uh, a little bit. You can read about this in, in Wikipedia and in stories of Fanny Crosby. Uh, a few words of hers, right? At, at the age of eight, Crosby wrote her first poem which described her condition and her trust in God. She later remarked, 
it seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for this dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. Right? So much is her faith. And she had really entrusted God, trusted God with whatever has happened. Says, so much is my faith that I don't, I don't want to have sight that maybe if I had seen all the beautiful things in this world around me and the interesting things, I may not have been so focused on God. And sometimes we find ourselves in such situations where the interesting and beautiful things all around us in this world has taken away all our time. Maybe it's our work, maybe it's our family, maybe it's entertainment. So many things have taken away all our uh, all our focus, all our dedication to God. And in God's mercy, He's not made us blind or anything. He's, he's made us whole. And you see, Fanny Crosby started memorizing the Bible. He mem she memorized the whole Bible when she was a child, the entire Bible. At five chapters a week, she memorized the whole Bible. And uh, God exalted her. She was a friend of the presidents of the, uh, the, um, of the United States of America. She wrote more than 8,000 hymns in her life. Uh, one of the most famous hymns, Blessed Assurance, is written by her and many other famous hymns as well. 8,000 and more hymns. Can you believe that? Right? God used her in such an amazing way. When she had given whatever she had to God, she entrusted her whole life with whatever there is of life to God. And God used it the way He felt right. right? Now God has given us abilities. God has given us talents. God has given us certain things. We have shortcomings, we have, uh, but we have things given as well. And God expects that we entrust our lives to His hand. Right? Jesus says all through that God is our Father, He is our loving Father. What holds us back from entrusting our lives into the hands of this Maker? Right? The, the one that we are entrusting our lives to is the God of the universe, the God who created heaven and earth and the God who sustains all things. And the God who will destroy all things in the end. The God who's made us, who's put this breath of life in us. Who can take away this breath of life whenever he wants to. Right? There is no other safer hands to which we can entrust our lives than the lives of Jehovah, our God. We know the truth. We know the true and living God. And so we can do this. And God knows what he's doing. We can trust him. And the Bible says over and over again, trust him, trust him. Trust Him with all your life. Lean not on your own understanding. Stop trying to run your own life. Just trust in Him. Commit all your ways to Him and He will make your path straight. Jesus said over and over again, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Why do you not trust me? Right? And uh, there's one thing here. What is the meaning of trust? Right? Many of us have a wrong understanding of the meaning of trust. Now, we think to trust in God is to believe that God will answer our prayer and God will give us the outcome that we are going to Him for. That's trust. And I trust that God will give me the outcome that I am seeking Him for. That is not what biblical trust is. Biblical trust is not to trust for a specific outcome but to trust in God in the situation itself. Right? Whatever the outcome may be, I trust that you will do what is right for me. That you will bring about the right outcome. Right? So maybe it's if there's a particular job, then God, I trust that you will give me this job. That's not biblical trust. To trust is to say, God, I trust that you will provide for my needs and you will give me the job that you want me to have. Right? At the right time. Right? Now, you see there's a difference between these two trusts. Because one is trusting for a specific outcome and one takes a few steps back. It's a few points down the line. It says, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you that you are my provider. I trust you. Maybe you are praying for healing. right? The, the biblical trust is to say, God, I trust you. With, I entrusted my family into your hands and myself into your hands. right? And I know that you will do what's right and what's perfect. And I don't have to worry. And that's trust. So are you willing to trust God this way? For whatever it is that you are seeking the Lord for. You know, maybe it's a marriage. And you say, God, I, I trust in you completely that you know how to run my life. 
and you're a loving father and you will do what's right and perfect and best for me. And uh, that brings us then to the last and final point, trusting God through persecution. And you see, this is really the final test, right? The last point, trusting God to the point of death. And the, the thing is that we can be rest assured that if we haven't already entrusted our lives to God completely, we will not be able to stand at times of persecution. That's a given, right? Uh, because what's being... You see, God allows us to be tested at various points so that we can move forward on the scale, you know, from trust, trusting Him in certain sort of scenarios to really trusting Him in bigger things and finally trusting Him to the point of death with our whole life and our family's life. And persecution really tests us at the at the real at the real end. And then let's look at what the Bible has to say about this topic. You can read about it in Hebrews chapter eleven. Uh, maybe one of you can read Hebrews chapter eleven, verse thirty six and thirty seven. So this is what uh, the Bible says that this is what happened to these people. They were stoned, they were sawn into, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword, etc, etc, etc. And uh, Jesus himself said that if they persecute me, will they not much more persecute my followers? So that's what uh, the Bible says. Now what about history? What do we learn from history? And uh, if we look back at history over the last 2000 years, we know that God's people have been persecuted. Uh, just one example, I want to tell you the uh, story of a woman, a young woman called Perpetua. Uh, this is in AD 200 and this is in Northern Africa. By this time the gospel had come to Northern Africa, there were Christians there. And that was also a Roman province. And uh, there is this young woman, she's got an infant. So she's in her early 20s and she's become a Christian. Right? So um, all the Christians in that area, they are commanded to sacrifice to idols. And she refuses, right? So the authorities, they, they capture her and all the other Christians with her. They put her in a dark dungeon. They deprive her of a child. But uh, there are a couple of you know, jailers who have mercy on her, allow her to go out for you know, a few minutes each day and feed her child. And this goes on for some time. And finally, all the Christians who are in jail are summoned uh, before the judge. And the judge urges them to deny Jesus Christ. And they all, one by one, refuse to deny. And it comes to Perpetua's turn, and she's standing there, and the judge asks, okay, can you deny Jesus? And suddenly her father, uh, who's an aged man, her father, who's not a believer, father carries her little infant, and comes before her and says, please, for the sake of your child, deny Christ, or your child is going to die. And it's a very emotional moment and then the judge also says, says, see, at least for the sake of your aged father, deny Jesus. Right? All you have to say is, Jesus is not my Lord. And you can go back and live your life however you want. But she refuses. Right? And finally, uh, the judge asks, are you a Christian? And she says, yes, I am a Christian. And at that point, she and all the other Christians with her are brutally killed. And they're all taken away they are killed, some are killed by wild beasts, lions, uh, and tigers, some are killed by bulls, uh, and some are killed by gladiators. And Perpetua as well died <coughs> in one of these ways. And we see, we see that this, this is just one story out of many, where people refused to reject Christ, or even to say that Jesus is not my God. And they had to, they had to die, right? At, uh, a serious cost. And as we read uh, all through and then there is this uh, the, the dark ages where again there were these inquisitions and many people died. And uh, we read in, you know, about this what's recorded in, in historical books about the first three centuries. Now this is not the Bible, this is books of history. 
and it, death was not considered enough punishment for the Christians who were subjected to the cruelest treatment possible. They were whipped, disemboweled, torn apart, stoned, plates of hot iron were laid on them, they were strangled, they were eaten by wild animals, they were hung, they were burnt alive, they were tossed on the horns of bulls. Nevertheless, the church continued to grow. Right? So we see that uh, there are people who stood strong for their faith. And there are also people who did not. There are many instances of people who did recant and they did succumb to the pressure and said, okay, I, I give up. Right? Jesus is not my Lord. And they had their lives back. Now, there are people who believe that God will not allow this people to undergo persecution. That God is so merciful that uh, even in the end days, God's people will not have to undergo persecution. Uh, I would love to believe that to be true. But that's not where the evidence of the Bible and history points to. The Bible says that there will be great persecution at the end times, more than there ever was in the history of mankind. And God's people will be persecuted. Right? And we don't know how close the, those end times are. But we see all around us that persecution is on the rise. It's coming closer and closer to us. And there is going to be a time when we will also have to stand face to face with persecution. And we will have a gun or a sword put to our heads and the heads of our family members and said, are you willing to denounce Jesus? And I tell you, if we haven't before that entrusted our, our whole lives to Jesus Christ completely, we are not going to be able to stand at that time. Right? And the consequences are very severe. You saw in the life of Saul and many other lives, the consequences are severe. The question then is, have you given your whole life to Jesus Christ and said, God, I trust you with my whole life. I trust you to the point of death right? for me and my family. I trust you with all things in my life. And the implications of entrusting your life to God are that in the specific situations and circumstances that come your way, you will not waver. Because if you've entrusted your whole life to Christ, obviously you've entrusted the aspect of your job and your marriage and your healing and all these things. These are subsets, right? So the question is, have you really given your life over to Jesus Christ? And when God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, this is what God meant. That you trust Him with everything that you have, with your whole heart. Right? And when Jesus said, you deny yourself, you carry the cross and follow me, what He meant is that you deny your life. Jesus said that those who uh, you know, save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will, will save, will uh, gain it. This is what Jesus meant. Are you willing to entrust your life completely to Jesus Christ? Right? So that, now, uh, I believe that there are people here today whom the Holy Spirit has spoken to clearly. Right? And if God has spoken to you, then respond in obedience. Right? Don't wait because you don't know what situation and circumstance lies ahead. Don't let another day go by because we don't know how long our lives on earth are going to be. Right? But obey whatever the Holy Spirit prompts you to entrust your whole life to Jesus and say, Lord, I trust you with all my life, even to the point of death. Which means that I trust that you will provide for me. I trust that you are my loving Father. I trust that you will give me everything that I need in this life, at the time that I need in this life. I'm willing to commit all things to you, to you even at the cost of death. So I, I'd like, like to I'd like you to, uh, even as you take a minute to Think about this and listen to anything that uh, the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you. I'd like to um, call Rakesh up and if there's anybody here who whom God has spoken to and has not really in the past entrusted himself as of completely and if you've been convicted to do it then I'd ask that perhaps you can uh, stand up and come forward as even as Rakesh stands up and prays 
uh, for us. Just as an act, as a sign, as a symbol that we remember ourselves that this day, Lord, by your grace, with your help, I want to entrust my life completely to your hands.